police are appear to be approaching it. Devastation and disgust in the community after students from Newport Harbor High School and Costa Mesa High School posted these pictures on Snapchat. Caption German engineering. The images show students using cups set up like a swastika for a drinking game and giving the Nazi salute at an off-campus party. The photos have sparked outrage across Southern California. We really thought that we were past this in this country, but here it is again. my computer to check the news this morning and I see that this is happening 20 miles from my house. Holocaust survivor Eva Schloss, the stepsister of Anne Frank, is currently on a California book tour and met with students in the photos to educate them about the Holocaust. So this woman, she survived the Holocaust and now she has to see this. I mean, what that must do to her and, and her, her heart and her mind I can't even begin to understand it. When I heard about this incident here, I was shocked that in 2019, in a well-educated town, in a very high-educated school, that incidents like this should still happen. You know, in the 1930s, the world ignored all the early signs of anti-Semitism. And afterwards, we looked back in hindsight and wondered, why didn't we act before it exploded? The signs are there again. Why is history repeating itself? That's why we knew we had to make this documentary. Montel and I, we made our first film together, Architects of Denial. We decided that we needed to document the Armenian genocide and the threat that still continues to haunt the Armenian people today, right now. When a group gets singled out and dehumanized, innocent people die. Listen, history re repeats itself again and again. Hitler knew all about the Armenian genocide. He studied it. And in a speech to his commanders before the invasion of Poland, he used it as an example of how the Nazis could commit mass murder and get away with it. He said, who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? Yes, Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, all connected by one thing, and it's really simple, hate. What became very painfully clear to us is the persecution of Armenians might be more of a localized thing today, but anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, is everywhere. Dean and Montel are both longtime friends of mine. It's kind of funny, they don't seem like they'd get along because they're so different. Dean is an ex-football player, now a great actor, and very conservative. Montel is an ex-Marine. He's a very opinionated talk show host and also very liberal. I've hosted an international travel TV show for years. I knew that both Dean and Montel were interested in wanting to help people, so I began inviting them on what I call volunteerism trips. We had some great experiences. We traveled to some of the most poverty-stricken places in the world, uh, Vietnam to give hearing aids to kids who need them, they, they can't pay for them. We went to Mexico to help kids get life-changing operations that they needed to fix a cleft palate. Nicaragua, Africa, to feed hungry children. That's a little one, there you go. My pleasure, Caribou. 
You know, when you travel all over the world, you find out that no matter where you live and no matter where you come from, we all have so much in common. And there are so many important things that we agree upon. We Look, we agree upon the fact that there are great injustices out there, like there should be no child going hungry anywhere in the world today. No one can deny that, but it's still going on. Unfortunately, so did discrimination and prejudice and hate. You know, a lot of people have asked me why I'm involved in this documentary. They say, are you Jewish? And I say, no, no I'm not Jewish, and neither are Dean or Montel. And actually, that's why I am so proud of them for making this documentary. Because we believe that now everyone, whether they're Jewish or not, needs to take a stand against anti-Semitism. Hate crimes can happen to anyone. Anyone, anywhere. Anywhere in the world at any time. Even though the world has built so many museums and so many memorials to those who were killed in the Holocaust, today anti-Semitism is actually on the rise. Anti-Semitic incidents across the UK in 2017 numbered the highest ever recorded in a calendar year. 1,382 episodes were reported, marking a 3% increase from 2016, which had also been a record total. At least 11 people are dead and six more wounded after a man walked into a synagogue near downtown Pittsburgh with an assault rifle and three handguns and opened fire. Tonight, armed guards have been posted at synagogues throughout Germany for the start of Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. In France, since the year 2000, 11 Jews have been murdered just for being Jews. The victims include young children, teenagers, and a rabbi. On est 15 millions sur la terre de Juifs. Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait de mal, de si mal? Pour être haï de cette manière-là, j'aimerais qu'on qu m'explique. Antisemitism, first of all, is a word invented by antisemites. It means hatred of Jews. But uh, in the 1870s, uh, they, the people who were hating Jews invented the word antisemites to indicate that it wasn't the Jewish religion that they were talking about, and it wasn't anything about what the Jews believed that bothered them. It was the essence of the Jewish foreign origin from the Semitic Middle Eastern part of the world. These people were strangers in Europe, had no place in Europe, and they shouldn't be there anymore. Many people hoped and believed and thought that after the Holocaust, that anti-Semitism would go away. Given the force of this horrible tragedy that were perpetrated by human beings and other human beings, perpetrated by people who hated Jews, anti-Semitism was again at the heart of it. People thought, well, you know, they would see this and go away. And it was politically incorrect for a long time to express anti-Semitism in a great many places around the world. But this started changing. It started changing again in the 2000s. Due to its subordination to the Jews, the arrogance of the United States regime has reached the point that they occupied Arabia, the holiest place of the Muslims. For this and other acts of aggression and injustice, we have declared jihad against the US. What are your future plans? Anti-Semitism is much more on the surface than it was. My feeling is that because it's now above surface, it pulls more people into the orbit. The Holocaust was not created by idiots. 
but very highly educated, civilized people in Germany. The most civilized country that you could think of at that time. Deutsche Männer und Frauen, das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. Und der Durchbruch der deutschen Revolution hat auf dem deutschen Weg wieder die Gasse freigemacht. And they send in a transport of kids. The kids went down from the ramp, going straight to the crematorium. The little ones are being carried by the older kids. The not so little ones were holding balls in the hand. The girls were holding dolls in the hand. And they were singing songs, French songs, and some even singing Edith songs. And I can tell you one thing. I'll never forget it. When I got to bed, I closed my eyes, and I'm in Auschwitz. Thank you. I've been to Europe dozens of times. I'm seeing a steady increase in anti-Semitism. Belgium and Poland and Hungary, Greece, Spain, Scandinavia, everywhere. I have a lot of Jewish friends in Europe. Now it's reached the point where those who haven't already moved are scared. They have to hide any signs that they're Jewish when they're in public. There's a recent survey, and the survey says that 40% that of the 1.4 million Jews currently living in Europe have considered moving because of anti-Semitism. That's, that's over half a million people. Just like they did in the 1930s, they're leaving their homes out of fear. One place I've really noticed it is London. From January to the end of October 2017, more than 100 anti-Semitic incidents per month were recorded. In the worst case, you again get this situation where Jews are attacked from the historic far right, from the new far left because of Israel, and from some immigrant communities because of religious views towards Jews and worldviews that have come from the Middle East and have come into uh, to Europe. Well, thank you all very much. It's wonderful to be here in England. This is my first time in London. Walking around, um, I'm confused about what English nationalists are so worried about. This, this city is nearly half white. <laughs> came about four years ago while I was actually in London and I heard people talking about it. But people really didn't know about it until after he left. You can see from the video, it was not a very classy venue. But the frightening thing is, it sounds like a receptive audience. It's like he's doing a stand-up routine at a comedy club, but it's all pure hate. The Jews did it. <laughs> Oh, that was Andrew Anglin. He's the editor and founder of the Daily Stormer website. He founded it on July 4th, 2013, to replace his previous website that's called Total Fascism. The Daily Stormer is funded mostly by donations from site visitors, donations from people right here. Anti-Semitism is the resounding theme throughout almost all the articles. He was actually born in Ohio, and he now won't say where he lives, but we assume it's not in the United States. After the Shoah, after the Holocaust, perhaps it wasn't fashionable to say I hate Jews. Increasingly it is. We are seeing more and more physical expressions around the world. We're seeing physical manifestations in the United States. 5898 Wilkins Avenue. The complainants of shoot, of shooter in a building, a second call says they uh, are being attacked. Uh, they have shotguns. We're under fire. He's got an automatic weapon. He's firing out of the front of the synagogue. Inside this synagogue on Saturday morning, Robert Bowers opened fire on worshipers with an assault rifle and three handguns, murdering 11. It's 3410. Please send the medics up here. So many people gone. As he was shooting inside the synagogue, Bowers reportedly shouted anti-Semitic slurs and had recently written on his social media page, Jews are the children of Satan. According to investigators, his murderous actions were aimed specifically at Jews. Members of the Tree of Life Synagogue 
conducting a peaceful service in their place of worship were brutally murdered by a gunman targeting them simply because of their faith. Just because they're Jews? Here's what we can tell you right now. It happened in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood. That is a largely Jewish community. You know, I listen. I really, truly listen to the rabbi talk about what was going on in his mind when he saw what was happening around him. And you can't help but feel it yourself. I thought it was going to die. And and what did you what did you pray or what did you what did you what were you telling yourself as you as you were thinking that you were going to die? I was thinking I should hang up for nine one one and make a video for my wife. What did you want to tell her? I love her and my kids. There's an evil that you face when the victims are children or the elderly, the innocent, the ones that can't take care of themselves. There's an evil that is placed on top of that when it is against a group of people simply because of the way they pray and who they are. In the U.S., we've been seeing most of the anti-Semitism from neo-Nazis and far-right extremists. In France, it's been mostly coming from Muslim extremists. Following the 2015 attack on a kosher supermarket in Paris, the number of French Jews leaving for Israel has doubled to around 7,000 per year. So has anti-Semitism in the world, has it really returned to the point where, where Jews only feel safe in Israel? Do they really feel safe right there in the Middle East surrounded in an area they often describe as a sea of hate. I'm so happy that we had a chance to accompany Laura to Israel so we could get first-hand accounts from people who have lived through this. You know, we started asking questions and we found three sisters who had moved to Israel from France 10 years earlier and now advocate for other Jews to do the same. And why? Because they keep saying that, Montel, I feel safer here than I did in my home. My name is Jessica Knoll. These are my sisters, Noah and Karen. I made Aliyah with my family from France in 98, with the understanding that our future would be here. While my sister and I moved to Israel, where people believe that security risks are high, but we, as Jews, feel safe. I call on every Jew who feels threatened in his homeland to come to Israel and see that here it can be different. United we stand, divided we fall. Thank you very much. Moi, franchement, oui. Je suis bien ici. Euh, on n'a pas peur de sortir dehors, mettre une magaine David, d'avoir la kippa. Et quand je vais en France, je vais à Megève, je ne vais pas à Paris. Je ne me sens pas à l'aise, je ne me sens pas en sécurité. Je n'ai pas envie que mes enfants ils aillent là-bas. Je vois vraiment que... Je ne vois pas du tout qu'est-ce que j'ai fait à faire là-bas. Je ne me sens pas en sécurité. Et euh... Et pourtant, je continuerai à Paris pour, pour voir papa et pour voir la famille, et parce que <rire> j'aime Paris. Ici, en France, on est vraiment... Euh, moi, je sens qu'il y a une montée de la menace. Et je suis inquiet, pas seulement pour les Juifs, mais pour les Français aussi. Et aujourd'hui, on sent une montée euh, d'intégrisme dans une toute petite partie de la communauté musulmane. As Jews, we are not safe. In the early hours of April 4th, a 65-year-old Orthodox Jew was savagely murdered by one of her neighbors. It was Sarah Halimi, 
the killer was her neighbor. This building in the Belleville neighborhood of Paris is where retired doctor Sarah Halimi lived. She was the only Jew in the building. Her apartment was close to that of a family from Mali, the Traores. Halimi's son recalled the many times he witnessed members of the Traore family hurling anti-Semitic slurs at Sarah and her family. On April 4, 2017, around 4 a.m., Kobili Traore broke into Sarah's apartment. A woman who lived nearby described what she heard, too afraid to show her face. I heard the blows of his fists on her skin. He was yelling and was very aggressive. The attack lasted 20 minutes. No one came to help. Then Kobili Traore threw Halimi from the third floor balcony to her death in the courtyard below. He threw her off the window while saying, he was citing verses of the Quran and that he'd found the neighborhood shaitan. Shaitan means devil in Arabic. Sarah Halimi's brother is still haunted by the loss of his sister. He targeted my sister because she was Jewish. Her neighbor and his family would spit on the ground when she passed by. Her assassin called her a dirty Jew. Disiez quelques mots sur Sarah Limi, qui était votre sœur Ma sœur, ma sœur représentait le Tov. Elle représentait le, elle représentait le bien. Elle était médecin de, de profession et de formation et directrice de crèche, de la crèche de Pavé. Elle, elle s'est occupée pendant les 30 ans de sa carrière de presque un millier de bébés juifs. Elle leur a appris, elle leur a appris les brachotes. Elle aura appris à les chants de Shabbat. Anti-Semitic violence has been on the rise in France, home to Europe's largest Jewish community. Last year alone, reported incidents surged by 26%. Jewish places of worship and burial sites have also been increasingly desecrated. Is anti-Semitism growing in France, and why do you think that is? Well, the reality is it, it is growing, but the reality is also that it has been growing for a very long time. Looking back to the year 2000, we saw the start of the Second Intifada, a period of intensified Israeli-Palestinian violence. And then in 2001, 9-11, you see a surge in anti-Semitic acts in France, up to over 350 per year, and it has never gone below that since then. I think we're very mal, très mal parti. Et c'est pour ça que je pense de plus en plus que la place des Juifs est ailleurs. Les Juifs d'Europe n'ont plus leur place en Europe. Anti-Semitism in the world is a very long and very sad history. The Jewish people have, throughout history, been singled out and used as scapegoats that could take the blame for any economic problems within the kingdom. You know, it could deflect responsibility from the monarchs themselves. Myths that grew over the centuries have haunted Jews the entire time. In the first century, it was said that Jews were responsible for killing Christ. From the 5th through the 15th centuries, they were thought to cause deadly epidemics, and, and parents used to say that they would drink children's blood. In the modern times, Jews were called greedy schemers who were conspiring to take over the world. And ideas like this are all laid out in a book of lies called Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a book circulated by the Tsarist Russian secret police in the early 1900s. And it's a fictitious account of a meeting of Jewish leaders from many different nations who were planning to dominate and enslave all of mankind and put an end to Christianity. The Russian government used the document for propaganda to focus the anger of a long-suffering Russian uh, population away from the government and onto the Jews. Adolf Hitler was introduced to the document and he made it a staple of his Nazi propaganda and he spread it further and further around the world. You can trace contemporary anti-Semitism back historically to Europe, even to the Nazis. And basically what's happened is political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood coming out of Egypt, actually form an alliance with the Nazis. And this goes way back throughout the Middle East to the intellectuals of the Brotherhood. They have this strong alliance with European anti-Semitism and the Nazis, and they take 
materials like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This is sort of the lie that emerges in Europe in the late 1800s, where the beginning of the Holocaust, the beginning of sort of uh, genocidal anti-Semitism really begins to emerge as a serious force. I'm Hanaz Afridi. I run the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College. I am a full-time professor I also teach Islam, so I'm originally from Pakistan, and I work on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia both. The Holocaust is unique, right? Holocaust was not just in Germany, it was in Poland, it was in Czech, it was in Italy, it was all over, it was in Tunisia. So the whole point of the Holocaust was to exterminate Jews off the face of the earth. I don't care if someone wants to sit there and deny it, they can do it to their blue in the face. Anti-Semitism in what we call the Muslim or Arab world began in the 1920s all the way up to the end of World War II. Now the other aspect of that was that there was already resentment and the resentment was not necessarily about Jews, it was about Europeans. And to have been defeated in 1922 as the last Jenny Empire, the Ottomans, there was also resentment in the Arab world of the colonization for many years, almost 335 years. So all of these things compiled into one was a resentment against the Europeans. And what was going on was Nazis had propaganda everywhere. They were in desperate need of an ally. The Hussein al-Mufti, who was the Mufti of Jerusalem at the time that Hitler was in power, only met with Hitler once. The Mufti tried to meet with him again. He was blown away by Hitler. I have no doubt what the Nazis did during that era and the alliances that they formed and the fact that the Mufti of Jerusalem sat in Berlin and some attribute to him the idea of the final solution and other things. Nazis wanted to bring the Jews to Palestine, try to make deals to bring them to Palestine, because they thought that the Arab states would annihilate them there and that they would do the dirty work for them. There were leaflets and radio programs and Nazi propaganda translated into Arabic, sent all over places like Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and Egypt especially. This became sort of this seed of the new European anti-Semitism that was sent there. You know, the Holocaust didn't begin with the railroad tracks or the bricks and mortars of the crematorium. It began with words and it began with ideas. And the ideas of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion lay the foundation to legitimize the removal of Jews from society, to put them into ghettos, and then finally to bring them to concentration camps for the final solution. So these words are powerful. Today, those words form the core element of the Muslim Brotherhood and of political Islam and all of its offshoots, from Wahhabism to the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, Hezbollah and Hamas as part of the Brotherhood as well. And they all carry this sort of Nazi-inspired genocidal anti-Semitism as the core element of their belief. And today, we can see the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is in the core of Hamas's charter, it's in the core of the Iranian Revolution regime's rhetoric, it's even in popular culture and film and music and political discourse. The head of the Muslim Brotherhood, the most important political figure and religious figure in the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Kawadawi, argues that all the believers must complete the work of Hitler. All the true believers are obligated to finish the work of Hitler. <laughs> The signboards of a Jewish restaurant smashed. A pig head marked with a Star of David dumped by a door. Swastikas and Stars of David daubed on a wall. This was the aftermath of an anti-Semitic attack in the eastern German city of Chemnitz in August 2018. 
And it was my son's turn. And the teacher asked, are you Jewish? And he said, yes. And that is when everything started, the attack started. And what exactly was everything? Um, it started with verbal abuse and bullying, and uh, but then also uh, physical attacks. He was beaten very badly. To an issue plaguing Europe. Nowhere is the issue of anti-Semitism more sensitive than in Germany. Yeah. And now there are new concerns there over rising Jew hatred after a young Israeli man was filmed being attacked on the streets of Berlin while wearing a Jewish religious skull cap. <laughs> You can't walk with the yarmulke freely in areas of Paris or London or Berlin. Felix Klein is Germany's official anti-Semitism commissioner. In a recent newspaper interview, he cautioned Jews about wearing yarmulkes in public. Here he offers an explanation. Anti-Semitism in Germany is always something very special uh, because the Holocaust was uh, uh, invented here and, and, and happened here. In spite of, uh, of all our efforts, uh, anti-Semitism is still existing. Efforts made by the German government include building this Holocaust memorial in the heart of Berlin. Still, 1,646 hate crimes were committed against Jews in Germany in 2018, and that was up 10% from the previous year. While the far right is responsible for nearly 90% of anti-Semitic attacks in Germany, an increasing number of these crimes are now being committed by Muslim refugees. Germany has taken in hundreds of thousands of them since 2015. These people were raised in countries where hate, uh, hatred towards Israel and towards Jews is uh, very common. We Germans have learned how to answer questions about anti-Semitism. And no German would say, I'm anti-Semitic or I hate Jews. So people find they learned it in rituals, in remembrance days and all this. How to answer these questions so they don't appear anti-Semitic. But they are. I came to Germany in 1993 when the Soviet Union was falling apart or Russia was falling apart and uh, a lot of Jews tried to escape this uncertainty. And that's how we ended up in Germany because we were convinced that this country, after having gone through all the political re-education of the years following uh, the World War II, that in this country anti-Semitism would be unimaginable. Berlin has a large Jewish community. And the official numbers are around 10,000. But if you count the people from Israel or the people who are not member of the Jewish community, it's probably more than 20,000. But Berlin is a kind of hotspot of anti-Semitism in, in Germany. The Jews must be erased. Hitler killed 90% of them. He left just over 10%. That's good. If Hitler hadn't killed the Jews at that time, they would have taken over the whole world. Here people from all over the world or from also opposite groups can come together and uh, think um, about their own stereotypes. We're all human beings, whether you're a Jew, a German, a Christian, a Muslim. One has to respect all Muslims, Christians and Jews around the world. We have here more than 50,000 Palestinians and more than 20,000 people who are somehow connected to Israel. And other things also started changing. A lot of conflict in the Near East with Israel policies becoming less and less understandable for mainstream in Europe. I have a special connection. My grandparents' family came from Germany on both sides. My grandparents were killed in concentration camps. The rise of anti-Semitism in Germany carries special significance. And because of the historical memories, because of the implications, and I think that the government there has done, but has to do much more. They work closely with the Jewish community in, uh, in Berlin and other cities. 
They have taken in 150,000 Jews who came mostly from Russia, who, who live in Germany today. But the rise of anti-Semitism and Germany at the core is often the place from which, which impacts all of Europe. In Berlin, we talked to Yuri Feinberg, a Jewish Israeli who came to the city six years ago and opened an Israeli restaurant. Well, Feinberg, he gets endless hate mail and insults and more. Last year, a man menaced him on the street in front of his restaurant, and a friend of Feinberg's recorded the whole thing. You'll get your comeuppance. In 10 years' time, you won't be alive anymore. Ah, death threat. In 10 years, you'll be dead. It was quite absurd. We were, not, we were talking quiet, we were having a cigarette and a coffee at the corner there, and then maybe from uh, 20 yards, so he couldn't hear the conversation. He couldn't even recognize that we belong to the restaurant. He just started to swear at us. Not sure that he's talking to me or to other people looked around, it's only us. I said, we? Yes, you, why? <laughs> and then it started, you are making a, you are raging a war against the Palestinians for 70 years. It's okay. Ganz einfach, weil er 70 Jahre Krieg gegen äh, Palästinenser führt. Ja. Ihr, äh? ihr führt einen Krieg gegen die Palästinenser. Ah, das ist jetzt eine linke Geschichte. Ich bin auch nicht link. Ihr führt einen Krieg. Ihr führt einen Krieg und wollt hier euch installieren. Das ist ein Restaurant. Und euch, das ja, ist ein Restaurant, israelisches Restaurant. In, Ber in Berlin. Darf man kein israelisches Restaurant in Berlin machen? Nein, nein, nein. Warum? So, so, so einfach nicht. Ja. And then he started to criticize Israel. Weil du hier bist, Und? in meinem Land, in oh. meinem Land, okay. du bist in meinem Land, ich, ich bin in eurem Land. So was soll ich zurück zu meinem Land was, was, was soll ich Aber ja. Sie haben gerade gesagt, dass wir nur für nicht in Israel ich, sein, weil wir greifen der Palästinenser an. Ja, ihr seid so, gestern, ich darf, ich ihr darf seid, hier nicht sein, aber auch nicht in der Palästinenser Ihr seid Gäste der Palästinenser. Ihr seid Gäste der Palästinenser. Und hier, was sind wir? Ohne Wunsch, sondern wir zurück Nein, zu Palästinenser Nein, ihr seid auch nur Gäste. So, wir sind überall Gäste, wir haben keine Recht auf keine, die, 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 die Kein Problem, ihr seid nur Gäste. And after a very short time, it um, started to be anti-Semitic things, like uh, that uh, we should not be here, we should uh, leave Germany, uh, the Nazis uh, that will go back to the gas chambers and stuff like this. Niemand schützt euch. Niemand schützt euch. Alle in den Gaskammerland. Alle wieder zurück. It was already too much and I was like, what, why, what do you want from us, leave us alone, it was more like this and he just didn't want to stop. That is anti-Semitism, openly Today, the people who founded this country have a fighting chance to take your back. 
Well, I was the mayor of Charlottesville when we experienced several events in 2017 where people saw anti-Semitism on display in public spaces. Ku Klux Klan, the modern day Ku Klux Klan that has come to Charlottesville to file the permit for a protest at this park that we're standing next to, which was renamed by the city council in Charlottesville. Previously it was Jackson Park and now it is called Justice Park. And it was part of, a, of an overarching mission that we've undertaken over the last year to finally tell the truth about race in Charlottesville. And that's put us on the radar of some really far right groups that totally disagree with that mission about finally getting it right about the element of systemic racism and white supremacy in our, in our history. Actually this began with a city council decision to remove the Confederate monuments uh, from uh, the, uh, the center of Charlottesville. Well, I think they were drawn to Charlottesville because we have to remember where we are. Virginia is part of the Confederacy. We were the last place to integrate schools. We have the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. If you've ever read the notes on Thomas Jefferson, you know where Thomas Jefferson stood on people of color. There's still a lot of issues in regards to race here in this community. And the only way for us to move forward is to deal with them head on. There were several events in sequence that led to each other over the course of last year. There was this first torch rally in May. And in response to that display of hatred, Mike stood up as the mayor of, of the city and said, this hatred does not represent Charlottesville today. And then the Ku Klux Klan came to town in July and they were abusing over anti-Semitic slogans and signs, you know, attacking me as the Jewish mayor of Charlottesville. And then there was this Unite the Right rally, which happened in August. And what Charlottesville represented was a seminal moment in American history where various hate groups felt emboldened to come together and declare their relevance in America in a very dramatic way. So we were seeing this trend, and we knew that Charlottesville was going to be the biggest white nationalist uh, public event in decades. We had been warning about what was coming uh, for years and for several months with increasing alacrity. I think that we were fearful of the scale of the August event. Anyone that monitors this stuff knew, knew that there was a tremendous potential for violence. The activists in the community were really sending the message and teaching the rest of us that August 12th was really gonna be the big event. I've been going to these kinds of rallies for, for decades, and you usually get a dozen or two dozen, sometimes maybe three dozen, but nothing like this. The other thing that was interesting was the coordination between previously disparate groups with different leaders. There was a, a coalescing of a socio-political force of white nationalism. And as everybody knows, one of the great places for putting forth anti-Semitic ideas is the internet. And not just the internet, all of the other media that we have, the new media as we call it, or the social media. Andrew Anglin's Daily Stormer calls itself the most, the most read alt-right website. But they do seem to be the go-to page in the US for, for hate. But what we do have within our reach is the media. Uh, this is where I'm focused, obviously. I don't care if you understand. The internet has really been a game changer in terms of the ability of extremists of all types to get their message out, and their message has become more and more powerful progressively. And unfortunately, it's moved from the margins more mainstream. This Nazi website actually said, next stop Charlottesville, final stop Auschwitz. So for years, anti-Semitism clearly existed, but it wasn't spoken about. The memory of the Holocaust was there. People were punished for speaking about anti-Semitism publicly, and um, they didn't do it as a result. What's changed is that social media has meant that people appear able to speak about things that they never spoke about 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The, 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 the dark recesses of their minds have been laid out bare for all to see on the internet. Beyond that, on social media, it's led to encouragement of uh, ideas. And there seems to be a, a thread within the far right now that rallies and demonstrations are the way to go. 
there was no one in our monitoring world that, that, that wasn't terrified about what was going to happen at Charlottesville. Nobody said that they couldn't come here and express their First Amendment rights. That's not what this was about, but this had nothing to do with coming here and expressing First Amendment rights. This had everything to do with coming here to spew hate, inflict violence, incite riots, intimidate. 500 white nationalists. We, I can't remember a, a, a public demonstration that large in, in recent memory. I and a lot of people had had the sense that it was gonna be very large and that led to an effort by city council to relocate the rally to a more rural location within the city of Charlottesville. And unfortunately, we lost that effort in a federal court. Um, the Virginia ACLU sued us um, on free speech grounds to prevent us from relocating this rally to this park. The Charlottesville city government was allowed to deny us our constitutional First Amendment rights. We might be in a different situation than we are today. This is uh, an un uh, unfinished story. It's a developing story. And as of today, the Constitution was upheld. That uh, march with tiki torches and hateful slogans peacefully conducted is protected by the First Amendment. And Charlottesville was obliged to grant a permit. The ease with which Charlottesville happened, the fact that, it was, that they were able to, uh, to bring um, crowds to bear on the subject, I think is important for us to remember that there's a threat from the far right. Unlike the Ku Klux Klan of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, these young racists and members of the Klan were not covering their faces. They were marching proudly. And that, that to me, uh, says something. That there's something ominous uh, and serious about that phenomenon. They're, they're proud to walk with their faces open. The intel was given that they were going to use a car as a weapon. And everyone knew this. This was not new. This was shared. So they knew the violence that was coming behind that protest. This is the man who police say was behind the deadly attack in Charlottesville. James Alex Field Jr. This morning in jail charged with the second degree murder of Heather Heyer. These photos show Fields at the rally Saturday just before the tragedy, standing with members of Vanguard, a group described as a white supremacist organization. Tragically, uh, Heather Heyer, one of the protesters, counter protesters lost her life, as did two police officers. They tried to kill my child to shut her up. Well, guess what? You just magnified her. She wanted fairness. She wanted justice. She wanted everybody to get equal respect. I'm so sorry, Heather. I'm sorry that you cared so much. Maybe if you didn't stand up or you didn't speak so loudly, maybe if you weren't so bold, that you, they wouldn't have heard you and you would still be here. This is so horrible. And to make things even worse, this poor woman who lost her life standing up to hate gets attacked all over again on the internet. When a group of people is singled out and dehumanized, it hurts everybody. The message of anti-Semitism was at the forefront of the Charlottesville March, but Heather Heyer wasn't even Jewish. She was just an innocent victim standing up against hate. We shall not be moved. Thank you, Sister Heather. We shall not be moved just like a tree. That's 
Just as anti-Semitism has a long history in Europe, sadly it has a long history right here in the United States. As immigrants came to populate and build America, unfortunately so did discrimination and prejudice and hate. There were only 250,000 Jews in the United States in 1880, but between that time and the start of World War I, more than two million Eastern European Jews moved here. And most of them were fleeing uh, pogroms, massacres directed by the monarchies of Eastern Europe. So they were just running to save their lives. And these immigrants, they were dirt poor. They came with a dream of freedom and a new life but unfortunately, they were followed by some of the ancient prejudices that they were trying to escape. I hereby nominate Mr. Henry Ford, President. Henry Ford may have built an industry, and he spent millions of dollars of his own money at the same time when that was a monumental amount attacking Jews. He bought the Dearborn Independent newspaper in 1919 and used it as a platform for his anti-Semitic ideas. He followed up with a book, The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem. If you look at the history of the United States, you look at Henry Ford, he wrote the famous International Jew. You look at the real, you know, deep-seated white Christian guys that really did not want to have anything to do with Jews. We are Christian in so far as we believe in Christ's principle of love your neighbor as yourself. And with that principle, I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. The KKK is a group that is based and deep-rooted in Christianity. It's a group that becomes a cult out of what we call Protestant white Christianity. The anti-Semitism of today has many of the same characteristics as it's always had, and yet there's a newness to it as well. The unresolved conflict with the Palestinian people has been used as an excuse by people who hate the idea that Jews have a right to self-determination in their indigenous homeland, and sort of saying, well, because of ABC, we have a right to hate Zionists, we have a right to hate Jews, we have a right to hate Jews who support Israel. Anti-Semitism is what some are saying is behind the harsh criticism of Israel coming from U.S. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Tonight, Democrats are trying to minimize the self-inflicted damage from comments viewed as anti-Semitic by one of their high-profile freshman lawmakers. Are you going to apologize? Here, you see Representative Omar refusing to answer questions about statements many are condemning as anti-Semitic, even within her own party. Statements where the Minnesota Democrat seems to suggest that Americans who support Israel have, quote, an allegiance to a foreign country. I see there being a difference between criticism of a country, criticism of its administration and its government, and criticism of the people and their faith. Omar has also been called out for her posts on Twitter like, Israel has hypnotized the world, and claiming that U.S. politicians support Israel just because it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Michigan Democrat Rashida Tlaib is quick to defend her. When she speaks about those issues, what I hear is her trying to uplift my grandmother in Palestine, in the West Bank, and saying that there are real, actual, factual uh, evidence to show that there's human rights violations. Both Omar and Talib are among the few lawmakers who support a movement to force economic pressure on Israel, called Boycott, Divest and Sanction, or BDS. Uh, we, we want to make sure that our allies are living out the same values that we push for. Why do you support BDS? Why do you support BDS? BDS is the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. It was initiated by Palestinian Authority, supported by it, although it has many front groups. It propagates the idea that if there is a boycott of, of Israel, then they're going to push Israel to some sort of action that they, that they want us to take. Civil society in Palestine in 2005 started the BDS movement themselves. Well, I am really disappointed because I grew up listening to Pink Floyd. And now, one of the most visible proponents of the BDS movement is Roger Waters. No Waters is co-founder of Pink Floyd. 
and one of the most popular rock bands in music history. More recently, he's become known as a vocal critic of Israel and a spokesman for the BDS movement. To support BDS and to continue the movement that is going on on the campuses of North America. One of the campaigns Roger Waters is backing tries to convince artists not to perform in Israel. Join the cultural boycott of Israel. I endorse the cultural boycott of Israel. I endorse. I endorse. I endorse the cultural boycott of Israel. Some celebrities are pushing back. And it punched the f out of Roger Waters. He can't f deal with it. He's writing letters to Bon Jovi. Don't go there. It's a terrible place. Where do you want the Jews to go, Roger? Where do you want them to go? A lot of people are questioning whether anti-Semitism is actually the driving force behind the BDS movement. Being the son of a Holocaust survivor, I, I, I almost fell off my chair that somebody was able to be out on tour and during his tour, dress up in a Nazi uniform and have pigs floating around with the Star of David emblazoned on it. Well, on the surface, BDS proponents say they just want human rights for Palestinians. But when you look closer, there's a much darker purpose. Basically, it wants to eradicate Israel. It wants to end the occupation. And if you read the fine print, you'll see that the leaders of the BDS movement want to or perceive all of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel proper as occupied territories. When you look at the rhetoric that they use, it's from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Then I ask, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my family as a Jew living in Israel? It means that I'm not part of that future that they're trying to create. One of the biggest myths about the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it's been going on for centuries and it's all based on an ancient hatred of each other. Actually, that's not the case. Religion is involved, but mostly the conflict is centered around two groups of people who claim the same land. And that only started in recent times. It's the area along the Eastern Mediterranean that we call Israel and Palestine. That had been under Ottoman rule for centuries. After World War I, it came under British rule. Now, during that time, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews all lived together there fairly peacefully. Then, the Holocaust. The Jews fled their homes in Europe looking for a safe haven. So after centuries of persecution, most Jewish people believed that having their own country was the only way they could have a safe place to live. And after all the Jews had endured, most of the world supported the idea of establishing a Jewish state. And this part of the Middle East was the logical place for it because after all, the Jewish people originated in the land of Israel. It's the national expression of the Jewish people for a homeland, a state of their own, it's built in 3,000 years of tradition and history. We were driven from the country which we lived and never turned our back on it, never prayed to any other direction except to Jerusalem. According to the Hebrew Bible, a united Israelite monarchy existed starting in the 10th century BC. And the first appearance of the name Israel in non-biblical writings is in Egyptian records, written in around 1200 BC. Talk about the return to Zion in our prayers three times a day. People may have different visions of what that Zion will be, but the idea that the return of the Jews to Zion was something shared by Christians, Jews, even Muslims. After World War II, Britain hands over Palestine to the United Nations. The UN General Assembly partitioned Palestine into two states, one Arab, the other Jewish. But unfortunately, the Palestinians refused to recognize this arrangement. On the very next day, neighboring Arab states declared war against the new nation of Israel. More than 6,000 Israelis were killed in the year that followed. Many of them were Holocaust survivors. But in what many called a miracle, Israel won the war. 
in the process, they extended their borders, taking the western part of Jerusalem and a portion of the land that had been partitioned to Palestine. So this is when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that continues to this day really began and why it continues. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement has been gaining traction worldwide, and particularly on college campuses in the U.S. There is an idea that within the, the free thinking, free speech, educational world of campuses, that somehow hating Israel is socially acceptable. BDS is making some serious headway. Across college campuses, and in particular after Israel's summer 2014 war on Gaza, more and more student associations are urging their universities to stop investing in companies that operate in the Israeli-occupied Palestinian territories. And what's dangerous is a university is the place, the one institution in society that really trains our future leaders. And if their young students are being exposed on the campus, but also in the classroom, about these ideas of Jews today, it's alarming because another generation is going to be educated uh, to despise or to be critical, falsely, I would argue, of Israel. So I think, in fact, BDS has become this new word and the legitimate way to talk about anti-Semitism, um, even, even if these same people will say they're not anti-Semitic. Often it's just a tone of, of be suspicious of the Jews and of Israelis and how they're manipulating history and the world, etc. And that is often found in the BDS movement. The unresolved issue of Israel and the uh, future Palestinian state is uh, at the basis of a lot of modern contemporary anti-Semitism, and uh, it's undeniable both sides use it uh, as an argument. We hear, you know, the BDS saying this is a Jewish state, this is the self-determination of Jewish people. If you have it of Jewish people, why can't you have it for Palestinian people? In the same sense, we hear, you know, Jews saying we need a place to be safe. There's no progress being made there in any sense, and in the moment in which you don't have the dialogue, which is what BDS is actually trying to do, stop the dialogue, there is anyways no way out and no escape into it. So in a way, it's fueling anti-Semitism. Not in my name. Not with my university. We have a choice. Stop the occupation of the Palestinians. Stop the apartheid. Use your voice. Stop the violations of international law. Put this conflict to rest. Cut the toys. Make a change. Vote yes to BDS. Not in my name. Not with my university. I have a choice. I want to stop the occupation of Palestinians. I want to stop apartheid. Using the label of Israel as an apartheid state, which it is not, and to do other things to delegitimize Israel, to take away the support for Israel amongst various sectors, especially targeting younger audiences, as I said, on campus and off campus. They demonize Israel. They don't think that the Jewish people have a right to self-determination on what Israelis and Jews perceive as their land. They see this all as Islamic territory. The goal is to try and drive away support from Israel. So they deny Jewish history. Um, they'll say that there's no presence of history of Jewish people or Jewish uh, institutions, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, that this is all a Zionist lie. I think the um, boycott campaign, divestment campaign, is part and parcel of a legal process that has to be adopted. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn represents the most extreme example, I think, of an accepted leader of a major party who can continuously be exposed for engaging in outrageous behavior that would never have been tolerated towards any other group. And we will not allow our governments to go on with this cozy relationship, this cozy law-breaking relationship with this rogue state. This is a part of a trend that we see of trying to cover up anti-Semitism. And there's a, there's, this is the trend that's been going on in the last 15 years, making hatred of Jews socially acceptable. The UK Labour Party has been hit by accusations of anti-Semitism in recent months, especially against its leader, Jeremy Corbyn. The Labour leader has been accused of sharing platforms with Holocaust deniers and making offensive remarks about British Zionists. The evidence is overwhelming that Corbyn singles out only the nation state of the Jewish people, uh, that is tantamount to 
anti-Semitism. Stop all aid to Israel. Free. Suspend with immediate effect the European Union Israel trade agreement. I don't think this is 1939, but it looks a lot like 1933. The BDS movement could cost Israel up to $11.5 billion a year if the EU enacts a law to block foreign investment in the country and boycott all Israeli goods. The BDS movement is economic boycott. Let's look at the equality issues, let's look at poverty, and let's look at access to quality of life issues like education, clean water, freedom of travel, all of those things that I think are directly impacting Palestinians there. This is economic warfare against the state of Israel, but the real victims often are the Palestinians. This is the Scarlett Johansson commercial for SodaStream, a product that makes tap water into flavored soda. The company says its West Bank factory employs over 500 Palestinians and gives them the same benefits as Israeli workers. This is unique in that it's located in the West Bank, in area C of the West Bank, and we're able to employ people um, of different kinds, the Palestinians side by side with Israeli Arabs and with Israeli Jews. SodaStream is being criticized because its factory is on what is seen as occupied Palestinian land. When factories close up, when businesses are unable to function, it's the Palestinians who are employed there who lose their jobs. Fundamentally, Jews have the right to a nation state that's been recognized morally, it's been recognized under international law, and it is the reality that that state exists. Israel, it was one of the most moving experiences of my life. I was able to pray at the Western Wall. I had a, a nice long meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. I visited the Knesset. I brought my son along with me so he could experience this too, and it was incredible. Israel does successfully coexist peacefully with many of its neighbors. And what is that successful relationship really like? Well, we wanted to experience it firsthand for ourselves. I was lucky enough to go to Princeton University and some of the people you meet there are so amazing. Um, and one of the people that I met was uh, someone who's become a great friend of mine, uh, Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed of Jordan. And he gave us a wonderful opportunity um, to, to get a real sense of Jordan from the inside. Honestly, I, and I've known you for 30 something years. <laughs> and I had no idea what to expect coming here. I, I, I obviously felt very comfortable to bring my son and we've all brought our families. We have, as we're tourists from different countries, Jordan is safe uh, by the grace of God and we, we want people to come here. Jewish tourists do visit Jordan, especially magnificent ancient sites like Petra. In fact, Jordan seems to be encouraging them by waiving visa fees for Israeli tourists the country is home to two million Palestinians, and although anti-Semitism remains common among people of Jordan, the government of Israel and Jordan have had official diplomatic relationships since 1994. It was then that Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Jordanian King Hussein signed a peace treaty three months after declaring the end of the state of war between the neighboring countries. Of course, relations become strained at times, and, and it, somehow Israel has been able to maintain very peaceful relationships with their neighbor, Jordan. Recently, they signed a, a $10 billion agreement for Israel to supply natural gas to Jordan through a pipeline. Another agreement is a plan that'll provide water to Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. Could this be a model for the two-state solution? It's hard to know because the issues between Israel and Palestinians are so complex. And the broader picture, though, is if the Israel and Palestinian conflict was finally resolved, would that put an end to anti-Semitism around the world? I think many people believe that if there was peace here tomorrow, then anti-Semitism would go away. And I wish that were true. I don't think it's true. Um, anti-Semitism wouldn't just go away if we managed to make peace with our Palestinian neighbors and all of the other countries around us. I don't think it would. There's something about the anti-Semitism that's way beyond it. 
When we were in Israel, we met three sisters who had moved to Israel from France 10 years earlier. Karen talked about the horrific murder of a Jewish grandmother, Sarah Halimi. It was Sarah Halimi. The killer was her neighbor. Well, the story didn't end there. A little over a year after that murder, those three sisters suffered a terrible loss in the same unthinkable way. My beautiful 85 years old Holocaust survivor grandmother was murdered six months ago by two Muslims in her apartment in Paris. They came in. I suppose she was sitting in her chair because she couldn't move, she couldn't walk. God's known what they did to her. What we do know is that they stabbed her 11 times. And if it wasn't enough, they burned her in her apartment. In Paris, where Mireille Knoll was gruesomely murdered last Friday, Hassin, her Muslim neighbor, who was well known to the victim, stabbed her 11 times and burnt her body. Tens of thousands of Parisians took part in a silent march in honor of the murdered 85-year-old Jewish woman. One year before my grandma, it was Sarah Halimi. Do we need to live in a world knowing that the killer of our grandmother who was so brutally killed may not be convicted. I don't know what the French justice will do. For Jews in France, anti-Semitism holds a very special significance and the French government's lack of accountability for it brings back so many painful memories. French Jews you remember all too well that for 50 years, over 50 years, the French government denied that they had any role at all in the Holocaust, when in fact they actively helped deport 76,000 people, including 11,000 children from France to concentration camps during the war. For Jews that did survive, some of their most painful memories center around a roundup in 1942 called uh, Veldiv, where thousands of Jews were rounded up and held in a huge sports stadium, and then finally loaded onto train cars. And most of those people never returned. And you could not run away from it because there was a policeman every, every half a meter. They were planning all around us. You, you could not run away, they were there. And I saw some policemen crying, and I saw some policemen laughing. You never what? saw a, a German soldier in there. You only saw French police. And they put us in cattle cars. They loaded up and then they, they put seals on the doors in a train, it seemed like forever. We can't be silent anymore. My grandmother lost her voice. She had her voice viciously stolen. And now, it's our responsibility to tell her story, so the world would know. What do you think? <laughs> that was the house for my mother on the second floor, where the windows are open. She was living here with his mother and father. Ma mère était jeune. Elle avait 8 ans et on lui a fait porter l'étoile jaune. Mais comme mon, mon grand-père était athée, et il faisait les traditions, mais il n'y avait pas de religion à la maison. Donc ma mère ne savait pas ce que c'était qu'un juif. 16 of July, oui, 1942. Uh, my mother and uh, her mother went to the market. They leave the apartment and they never come back before 1945. They, they catch the, the Jews and they send to Veldiv. It is why uh, it was very important when they saw that, they went uh, directly to the bus to the south of France. And it saved them because the 12,000 Jews were in Veldiv and they were killed.
Ma mère a habité depuis 50, plus de 55 ans dans cet immeuble. Et ma mère, elle est restée toute sa vie dans cet appartement que nous avons connu. On est nés tous les deux. Enfin, moi, je, moi non, mais Daniel est né, on avait cet appartement. Elle était parmi les premiers locataires. Elle a vu euh, arriver euh, des gens de toutes origines euh, qui sont, euh, au fil des années, qui sont venus s'installer en France. Castilla. You have the room, the bathing room and the kitchen. I don't want to come here. You can go with my brother if you want. My mother was very appreciative. The oldest lady of the building. She had very good contact with everybody. Notre petit café matinal va me manquer ainsi que votre sourire et votre douceur. Que votre repos soit paisible, ma chère Mireille. Leïla. On ne t'oubliera jamais Mireille de, Na de Nala Idou. Il est inadmissible qu'aujourd'hui euh, on puisse mourir parce qu'on est juif. Et après, il est arrivé malheureusement ce qui est arrivé à ma mère qui, qui ouvrait sa porte à tout le monde et qui aimait bien en plus ce jeune homme qui l'a assassiné. Incompréhensible. I miss her all the time. My grandma was full of life, full of joy. She was such a good soul, you know? Il en est branché la zone de notre bois. Ah bon? Ouais, c'était pour nous, mamie, c'était... Euh, elle nous prenait au cinéma, elle nous amenait partout, quoi. Au cinéma, au parc, euh, au restaurant, on mangeait toujours chinois avec mmh. elle. C'était son préféré avec son petit coup de rosé. Parce que c'était une femme très douce et très, très gentille et avec un cœur euh, énorme. C'était vraiment un être humain spécial et euh, je l'aurai toujours comme ça en mémoire. Le, le 27 mars dans la nuit, j'ai reçu un appel téléphonique à 2h du matin de, de la, la présidence, nous, demandons si, nous demandant si nous accepterions que le président soit présent en toute discrétion. Si tu veux, nous, on a, on, on a été au cimetière. D'abord, il y a Monsieur le président Macron qui est venu. Et c'était important. Euh, j'ai appelé euh, tous ceux qui ont une mère à manifester et il y a eu à peu près 30 000 personnes euh, qui ont manifesté. Et il y avait de tout, il y avait des blancs, des noirs, des jaunes, des, 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 des musulmans. Our duty as citizens here is to say no to barbarity. They want to divide us. They want to bring back the 30s and 40s. Hatred, no. I think all French people, whatever their faith or political views, have to be united against terrorism and anti-Semitism. But we have to understand, every time a hate crime happens to anyone, it happens to all of us. It may start with the Jews, but it never ends with the Jews. And we've seen hate right here, right here at home. Today, there are plenty of anti-Semites here in the United States. There are far-right neo-Nazis in Europe. There are Muslim extremists in the Middle East. And now, increasingly, in Europe, Jews are attacked from all sides of the political spectrum. What more do we have to do to stop this? 
We've built all the memorials we can build. We've written all the stories in history books. What more can we do to stop it? What does it all mean? That we are survivors, right? Because we are Jews. Is that our verdict? Why can't we just live? So many lives lost for what? Just because they're Jews. And it seems like it's never going to end. Best I can tell you at this point uh, is that we had uh, four folks with gunshot wounds. Uh, we do have one fatality. Uh, the rabbi was shot in the hand. It wasn't just a shooting, it was a massacre. It took less than a minute, but it was pure terror, as 19-year-old John T. Ernest allegedly opened fire in this synagogue during Sabbath services. Three were wounded, but 60-year-old Lori Gilbert Kay was killed as Rabbi Goldstein stood just a few feet away. And I walk into the lobby, and I see Lori laying on the floor unconscious, and her dear husband, Dr. Howard Kay, who's like a brother to me, is trying to resuscitate her. And he faints and he's laying there on the floor next to his wife. And then the daughter, Hannah, comes out screaming, Daddy and Mommy, let's go. This is the most heart-wrenching sight I could have seen. The shooter fired only 10 rounds before his rifle jammed, likely preventing many more casualties. Eight-year-old Noya Dahan was one of those who escaped, but not without scars that will haunt her forever. So I have this, there's little, oh, yeah. um, there's a piece of bullet. Do you feel safe here, Noya? Well, I don't really feel safe because this is not the first and definitely not the last time this is gonna happen. I wish I had a magic bullet to address the issues of intolerance, to make the world a more pleasant place for everyone, to give everybody a good chance to make a life. It would be wonderful. I really wish I could. Maybe I'd win a Nobel Prize too. That would be nice to just happen along the way. Um, and I don't have a magic bullet. I think some of it is, you know, is intrinsic in who we are as humans. Otherism is a way of, it's a defense me mechanism that we develop over time and throughout centuries of, of survival. Demonizing the other is becoming more and more severe. Diversity, pluralism, inclusivity, and innovation are all consonant, and that's the key to the future. We have to invite people across a divide on the table. Um, if I talk to people who are just like-minded, I'm not making a difference. But I need to talk to people who are not like-minded. I need to talk to more Jews who are not, who are not sympathetic to Arabs. Um, I think Jews need to talk to Jews that are not sympathetic to Muslims. I work with uh, Muslim intellectuals and Muslim human rights activists. Some of them are Palestinian, many from other countries in the region. This crisis is only spreading, and you're beginning to see the rise of nationalism and xenophobia in Europe, and if these type of short-term thinking doesn't change, then I think we're, we're heading for more turbulent times. The question is gonna be putting together inclusivity and pluralism and policy into an agenda for these countries where otherwise these fear-based nationalists are constructing villains and heroes in a way that we've seen that play out in the past that cannot be allowed to gain more traction. National political parties have an obligation. I think local political parties, we cannot excuse candidates who give expression to views that are intolerant, that are unacceptable, I am concerned about the polarization in American politics, about the divisiveness in society. If we don't acknowledge each other's pain, we can't talk, we can't have dialogue. If we start with denial, if we start with hostility, there is no conversation. 
People look at situations and they tend to see them in rather simplistic ways and to see them black and white. The real thing is that history and the things around us happen in color and we have to understand them in detail. And if we don't understand the nuances, there's no way that we can cope with them. And so again, education is so important, teaching people about complexity, to understand things in a complex way, and to be able to analyze them. Otherwise, we really have no hope of going from this information to knowledge to wisdom. We need to get to wisdom. And for that, you need a lot of knowledge. In essence, we're all one race, educating that in fact, the more open we are and the more accepting we are of each other, and the more we celebrate our differences, that's where the strength of humanity comes together. And to take away this otherism that comes with this defensiveness of our own, of our children, of our families, of our tribe, of our town, of, and going from there. Where will we be in a decade from now? With that question in mind, it is important to me to impart my grandmother message, something that she deeply be believed in. We must educate our children on the importance of love of all humankind. Thank you. Après le meurtre de ma grand-mère, j'ai reçu beaucoup, beaucoup de de messages de paix et d'amour de pays arabes. My texts, my emails, my Facebook overflow with love from strangers, people I've never met, people who are not from the United States, but from all around the world, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, all with the same message. We are here from you. My cup overflows with love. That's how you defeat hate. <laughs>